Good morning, and you know, seeing AAA up there this week, we went to Nashville, and uh, so we were driving down the highway. They had AAA on many of the billboards, but theirs stood for anger, which Chris, Chris preached on last week, anxiety, and addiction. Today, I want to take just a few moments, though, not to preach about addiction, but to preach about being alone. So let's take a minute and pray together before we start. Father, it's my honor to ask you to bless what we're going to say and bless what the people are going to hear. May be words of encouragement from your word that changes people's lives, that gives them hope to go beyond today. We just pray in Jesus' name. Amen. I'm just sitting here thinking, it's soon to be four years since 2020. Aren't those dates and the COVID epidemic etched in our minds. You know, one of the first things I did was during that time, I went on a turkey hunting trip and took a friend to Florida the week of March the 15th. And on the way down, everything shut down. And we enjoyed our trip in Florida. We got in the truck and headed toward Indiana. And we came to Atlanta. Everybody loves to drive through Atlanta, don't you? We came to Atlanta. We went to Atlanta in 25 minutes, one side to the other. I looked at Roger and I said, I wonder if Jesus came and we just didn't hear about it. Because it was an eerie feeling. You're used to bumper to bumper and eight rows of traffic and cars zipping in and out. And we'd look up and we would pass a car every mile or two on the interstate. But, you know, that was just the beginning, just the beginning of a period of isolationism for so many, for all of us, literally, when normal life and interaction ended. 2020 changed the way we interacted as family, as society, as a church, in our workplace. It just permeated our lives for that period of time. And it was a time when uncertainty and fear and loneliness raged openly wild. When we looked at ourselves and we looked at those folks around us, we realized we were alone. But you know what was neat about it? Even the slightest interaction with individuals outside our family brought us happiness. Even if it was just the UPS man who threw the box on the porch and said, Hi, I'm glad to see you. Or talking to a neighbor across the yard. Seems like my neighbors, we'd be out cutting grass and we'd safe distance ourselves. And we would talk and visit like we'd never visited before. Or here at church, drive-in church was a joy each week. If you didn't come during that time, you missed something special. Because we found out the importance of fellowship and gathering together. And people, you could just see their whole spirit change when they would talk to somebody else who pulled in beside them and they'd roll their windows down and they'd talk to each other. You'd see groups of people out on the parking lot. They were alone and they needed interaction. And you know, as a pastor, I see that all the time. When I go to the hospital or the nursing home or to someone's house, I see that empty chair where someone used to sit. And I see loneliness and hear loneliness from people's stories. Truth is, loneliness is at an epidemic stage in America. We have so many ways to communicate. But yet, people are lonely. 52% of Americans report that they feel lonely on a regular basis. More than 80% of young people under 18 report feeling lonely. Now, so folks, we'll do better off. Only 40 to 60, 40% of us feel lonely occasionally. 43% of People ages 18, 25 feel 
unloved. 73% of millennials say they are lonely. That's people 25 to 41. In this room today, it might be you. It might be the person just down the aisle from you or sitting in front of you. We are surrounded by people who have been touched by loneliness. All of our lives know someone or touch someone in our neighborhood, at our workplace, in our school that we know is alone. Could be a widower or widow, a divorced person, a single person, someone that's new to Brazil, Indiana, the outcast of the family. Here's one that I look always looked at. Have you ever met that person that's so obnoxious, nobody wants to be around them? We all know people like that, that are lonely. The person is rejected by their spouse or rejected by their family. Someone who's had those run-ins with the law, so they're separated from everyone. There are lonely people every way. So let's ask ourselves, why are people lonely? Some people are lonely because of social causes. We live in an area where, era where convenience and quick fixes and necessity have alienated us from interacting with people. Our relationships are shallow because of TV and mobility, because of the changing demographics of our society. Seems like with all the advances in our world today, we would be more in touch with those around us. Albert Einstein, he died in 1955, but listen to this. It's become self-evident that our technology has exceeded our humanity. He saw it even then. It's a cocoon, a cocoon effect. In my neighborhood, lots of times, people come home from work, the garage door goes up, the car goes in, and you don't see them the rest of the day and sometimes the rest of the week. When you watch the old Andy Griffith show, after Aunt B put out that big spread, how many evenings did they go out and have a seat on the front porch and sit down and visit her? Andy would bring his guitar out and play a song. Those days are missing. I'm an old guy. So I grew up here, and I had a rule. You had to be home before the streetlight came on. Okay? Didn't have a, I didn't have a watch until I was like in the seventh or eighth grade then. And, uh, but mom always said, be home before the streetlight comes on. But I had free reign in Brazil. There were a bunch of us who would get together and we would play baseball. In my junior high years, we all went to the park, to the cow palace. They had two basketball goals and we'd play ball. Sometimes with, when I got a little older, I could stay out later, ride my bicycle home. We played ball at eight or nine o'clock at night in the cow palace. And we interacted and we visited and we had friends and we did these things with. But today's society just doesn't do that. You know, I play music and we have groups of kids show up to play once in a while. And it's kind of like when those kids get done playing, they all leave. It's like Elvis left the building. And that's the way it is. A lot of ball games and stuff for your kids. As soon as the game's over, everybody's gone and you're there alone. And that's just part of the society today. Some people are lonely because of psychological causes. To avoid loneliness, we have three basic needs, attachment, acceptance, and adequate social skills. And if people don't have those and combine them with some emotional issues, oftentimes they are all alone. And you know, that's not part of God's plan. Because in Genesis chapter 2, it says it's got good for man to be alone. God realizes we're people who need companionship and friendship. All of us have a deep need for encouraging relationships. And lots of times people with psychological problems can't do that. I have a lady I work, I've known for probably 10 years in Terre Haute. And if you saw Kathy, you would never know she's homeless. She's always well dressed. Her hair's always clean. She's always looks great. 
but she lives in her car at the 46 Walmart because she cannot get along with people in a social situation. She doesn't seem alone. She has friends that, like, if she sees woman and I, she'll stop and talk to us for just a minute or two and then goes on her way. But because of her emotional issues, she lives that lonely life with all of her possessions and everything in a little car. Some people are lonely because of situational causes. You know, like someone who moves to Brazil. Brand new to the neighborhood, or moves to Clay County or Terre Haute, and you've, it's no one that you know. You've come from out of state or a long way off. The loss of a loved one, to someone that was close, can lead to loneliness too. One of the things that sometimes makes us stand alone is when we as Christians take a stand for what we know is right and wrong. If you're at work and something comes up and you take a stand and say, that's not right, you might find yourself, or even at school, find yourself standing all alone with no friends to support you because you've made a choice to do something God's way instead of the way the world wants to do it. So lots of times a situation can make us feel lonely where we aren't attached or don't have anyone to lean on. There's intellectual causes, too. When I think of that, I think of King Solomon, who was the smartest and richest man who ever lived. And he says in Ecclesiastes, life is meaningless. You know, it's lonely at the top. Now, I enjoy, now that I'm a part-time, part-time person for here at First Christian Church, I've been in leadership for 40 years before I came here. And now Chris will say, hey, Mark, can I talk to you? And he'll run something that's going by, and I'll look at him and say, Chris, I'm glad you're the boss and not me. Because lots of times when you're at the top, you stand alone when you take a stand for what you know is right. You know, some people are lonely because of physical causes. People that suffer from depression. More than likely for us, just like a little lady I visited with a few weeks ago, she says, my knees and hips are bad. I just can't risk getting out and falling. But some people are lonely because of spiritual causes. In the book of Ecclesiastes, Solomon writes, What do workers gain from all their toil? I've seen the burdens God's laid on human race. He's made everything beautiful in his time. He's also set eternity on the human heart. Yet no one can fathom what God has done from beginning to end. I know there's nothing better for people than to be happy and do good while they live. That each one of them may eat, drink, and find satisfaction in all of their toil. This is a gift of God. We all know those people that look at their lives and they say something's missing. You know, they live in the nice house. They drive the nice car. They have the kids that are doing great in school. They have a wife that, you know, is unbelievable. Everything's going right for them. But they still have an empty spot in their their lives and feel a sense of of longing and loneliness. That's what Solomon's talking about here. I always call this passage the donut hole of life passage. All of us are made different than the rest of the world. God breathed into you and I the breath of life, and we became a living soul. We have a spiritual side to us, and that spiritual longing leaves an emptiness in our life until we fill it. I always call it the donut hole theory. Our heart has a hole in it that only God can fill. 
Those people who don't have that spiritual foundation have this searching, this longing, this loneliness in their life like no other. And Solomon says, God wants to love you and care for you. He wants you to eat, drink, and find satisfaction in all your toil. He says that form of loneliness can be filled only by me. So we have that spiritual side. So what do we do with loneliness? Because it creeps up on all of us from time to time. And it could be a constant companion for some. What do we do with it? Several years ago, in police chaplaincy, I received a little book from a widow of a fallen officer. And it had some, and its title was interesting. Get Bitter or Get Better. Two choices. We have an opportunity to get bitter about something, our loneliness, or get better. And that's what I want to share with you today. How can we deal with loneliness? How can we move beyond that? First of all, remember, God is with you. That spirit of Christ that lives within us is our constant companion. In fact, in the book of Hebrews, it says, by he will never leave us or forsake you. That no matter what's going on in your life, God is always there. We can take heart as believers in that assurance that God is always with us. The second thing is to reconcile and restore break, broken relationships. Sometimes in your family, in your workplace, in your neighborhood, on your ball team, people get at odds. You can't get folks together that have differing opinions or different ideas that every once in a while you're not going to get at odds. And sometimes it drives you totally away from your family or your spouse or your coworker or your schoolmate or your teammate. And there you stand all alone. Remember, restore broken relationships. That may mean going and saying, I'm sorry. Do your part. You be the one to step out and reconcile that relationship. The passage here says, I lie awake. I become alone like a bird alone on a roof. And you say, boy, that's a weird way to explain that. Without relationships, we just kind of suffer and die. And that's what happens with birds. If you were to drive in along our area a few weeks ago, we had thousands of white geese and Canadian geese down south of Sealyville. Temperature was down below minus figures, minus chill factors. And you looked, and here were all of these geese huddled together, keeping each other warm so they could survive. You see a covey of quail. Or why did crows come to Terre Haute? Because they can gang up and keep warm through the cold nights. And it says when we have relationships that are broken, we're like a bird with no one to keep us warm, no one to help us, and no one to encourage us. Reconcile those relationships that are part of your life. Reach out to others. For none of us live our lives for ourselves alone, but none of us dies for ourselves alone. What's it saying? Some of us have loneliness because we're waiting for God to send someone into our life. You're sitting there and you say, you know, I don't know anybody at church. I don't have any friends at work. I don't know who my neighbors are. You're saying that to yourself. While the Lord may lead people to befriend you, sometimes you and I have to take the initiative ourselves and make the move towards someone else. Reach out to someone else. 
move beyond ourselves, that it's not all about me. Because when we begin to share ourselves with others, it pulls us out of that loneliness. It oftentimes pulls us out of depression and gives us a purpose in life. Now, here at church, how can we do that? I noticed for some of our older folks last year, one of our ladies hosted a dinner for widows and widowers. That was a great, we have a ladies Sunday school class that is for widows so that they can draw together and draw strength and encouragement from each other. But what about the rest of us? When you come in and there's someone sitting by themselves, what does it take to move out of my wife's pew, number four over here, and sit down next to somebody in pew number six over here? What does it take? It doesn't take a whole lot to do that. And by doing that, you've built strength for yourself and you've built strength in the body of Christ because you built a new relationship centered around the Lord. That's what fellowship is all about. Now, this morning, I was able to do it. The early service, we had about 100 here. I had one guy whose wife's in Florida. He was sitting here over here by him all, all by himself. And I knew why he was by himself. And I gave him a hard time. We don't have anybody like that today. But we want to encourage you to bond together when you come into worship. Meet that new person. Interact with Engage with someone in meaningful conversation. Also, if you make a new friend, or you have someone you haven't seen in a while, give them a call. Invite someone to go somewhere with you. Do something with you. But but here's the key. We can have a pity party. So we need to retrain our thinking about being alone. You know, Jesus went to lonely places, it says, but Jesus often withdrew, withdrew to lonely places and prayed. He knows what you're thinking. Sometimes we are alone and we can make the best of it. But we have to do this. If you've been raised with Christ, set your hearts on things above where Christ is seated at the right hand of God. Set your minds on things above, not on earthly things. That's resting in God's assurance about being alone. You know, all of us like to be alone. I tell people every once in a while, I go to Indianapolis to do hospital calls and stuff. Every once in a while, I love my wife since she's retired. She just goes places and we, we have an, I always tell people it costs me a whole lot less to go to Indianapolis to do a visit because I eat cheap and she doesn't. I also like to go once in a while because when I go down Washington Street, all those pawn shops are along there. And Mark goes in and looks at the guns and the guitars and the tools. And I don't have to worry how much time I take. Or when I come back, I go through Speedway and stop at this real neat gun shop. I like my time alone once in a while, but I don't want it to be an everyday thing in my life. So, but I'm assured that God is always going to be there for me in my life. So here's something I want to close this section out with. A quote from a Henry J. Newen in the Wounded Healer book. Remember that loneliness is a common human experience. A man can keep his sanity and stay alive as long as there's at least one person waiting for him. The mind of a man can indeed rule his body even when there's little health left. A dying mother and I've seen this dozens of times in ministry over the years, can stay alive to see her son before she gives up the struggle. A soldier can prevent his mental and physical disintegration when he knows that his wife and children are waiting for him. But when nothing or nobody is waiting, there's no chance to survive in the struggle for life. What gives us the hope to overcome loneliness? to succeed in our struggle. It's knowing that Jesus understands being alone. Jesus understands being alone. Here's an old hymn that we used to pull out and sing once in a while. Does Jesus care when my heart is pain? Do deeply for mirth or song 
as the burdens press and the cares distress and my way grows weary and long. He goes, oh, yes, he cares. I know he cares. It just comes out bursting with hope. His heart is touched with my grief. When the days are weary and the long nights dreary, I know my Savior cares. You know, it's more than just a song because Jesus truly understands loneliness. How would you like your life described as this verse from Isaiah 53.3? He was despised and rejected by men, a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief. That's Isaiah talking about Jesus. That's a sad description, isn't it? About life. You know, Jesus knows about loneliness because he was sinless. Can you imagine growing up as a kid and being perfect? But here was Jesus growing up as a child, perfect behavior. He no doubt had to stand out from all of his peers like a sore thumb. He couldn't relate with the joy of sin because he never did it. And therefore, he was an outcast, probably among his friends. You know, he was an, under his own family didn't appreciate who he was. And in this loneliness, he was that way. How often when I prepared, I thought, who can I say that would describe the oddity of Jesus being perfect and sinless and being an outcast and different? How many of you watch Young Sheldon? Isn't he an oddball? That's how Jesus was in his community as a child and a young man. He was the oddball. And he knew what loneliness was all about. There wasn't anyone to come up to Jesus and say, I understand how you're feeling because nobody ever felt like Jesus. And when he hung on the cross to die for you and I, when he said, my God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? At his most vulnerable moment, when he was dying for you and I, God shut him off. Closed the skies and there he hung alone and he cried out in loneliness to his heavenly father. You say, how do we overcome it? James 4, 8 tells us, come near to God, and he will come near to you. Loneliness touches all of our lives, but the assurance that God listens and God cares about you and I helps me go on to show you how little bit of encouragement can help you survive when you feel lonely. During the Vietnam War, Dozens of U.S. pilots and sailors and soldiers were imprisoned in Hanoi, North Vietnam, in a place they called the Hanoi Hilton. They were tortured. They were starved. They were put in little concrete cells with no contact with anyone else. Over the years, that could have taken its toll on so many. But those soldiers, those prisoners, they developed their own form of communication where they could tap on the wall and they would be able to communicate to each other. And you know what really sustained them? Somehow they remembered Bible verses and they would share God's word with each other. And by sharing God's word with each other, they made it through the loneliest, desperate time in their life. So no matter where you are, no matter who you are, God cares about what's going on in your life. He cares. And that's a tremendous message for those people outside these walls, that our God is a God of hope. He's a God of hope. He's a God of encouragement. And he's never going to leave you or forsake you. Let's pray together. Father, we thank you today for your word. 
and how it speaks to us. We thank you for Jesus and how he knows the messages in the bottoms of our hearts. He knows us when we're crying on our bed and we've lost someone we loved or we've missed an opportunity or we made a terrible mistake. He knows those feelings of loneliness. And today we pray for our church that we all might provide an atmosphere not of loneliness, but of acceptance and encouragement and help to those around us. Maybe someone here today needs a prayer for themselves or someone else. Maybe someone just says, hey, I need somebody to come and go have a cup of coffee with me. I need to know that someone cares with skin on. Today, Father, just speak to people's hearts and encourage them by knowing that you are with us. We pray it in Christ's name. Amen. Let's stand and sing together.